Well, good morning, everybody. Hey, thank you so much for joining us here at Foothills Online. My, my name is Blaine. I'm Rod. Yeah, and hey, I, I don't know about you, Rod, but I'm, I kind of think they're in the right place. Oh, they're absolutely in the right place, Blaine. Yeah, absolutely. yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Well, hey, and, and I hope that you guys had a wonderful Easter. I know here at Foothills, we had a fantastic day. God moved in big, big ways. Did you have a good yeah, Easter? I had a great Easter. Family, friends, the petting zoo was a major hit. Awesome. Oh, yeah, it was awesome. great. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm really surprised that we didn't walk home with two goats, a pig, and at least <laughs> at least one duck. I don't exactly. know. That was that. Yeah. Yes, was good. Yes. But you know, Easter was a fantastic day at the Anderson house as well. I have a 20 month old. We tried to get her to find some eggs. She's really not, not interested. I, I don't know. But uh, anyways, hope you had a great, a great Easter. And hey, if this is your very first time joining us online, we have a gift for you. And so if you type down into the, the, the connect line there, say that you're a first time guest and our live mo- uh, moderators, they will send you that first time guest right, right to your, your, right to your email. Right. Absolutely. Also, if you have a prayer request, let us know. Uh, indicate what it is. We will reach out to you. We want to connect with you any way that we can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And speaking of, of connection, there are so many ways at Foothills that you can connect. If you go to foothills.cc slash connect, you can actually fill out a card, give us some more of your information, and you can get on our email list and hear about some things that are happening. Or you can go directly to foothills.cc slash events and see all the things that are coming up here at the church. One of which I'm really passionate about. I, I'm the connection pastor. And so group, Groups, groups oh, yeah, is something yeah. that I, I really, really love. And so if you go to foothills.cc slash groups, you can see all the groups that are starting. They're actually starting tonight. And so you have time to join a group. We have four different kinds. Go on the website and see all the info about, about those. Also coming up, Blaine, uh, May the 1st is Baptism Sunday. Yeah. So if you made a decision for Christ, baptism is your next step. So we That's want to encourage you to sign up. Uh, for baptism. We would love to have a conversation with you yeah. and help you make that next step in baptism. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, and then on, on May 8th, we have another big day going yeah, it's on. Parent-child dedication. Yeah, uh, yeah. So we have a little one that's going to get dedicated, RJ, our eight-month-old. We're super excited. But also, it's Mother's Day that day. It's Mother's so Day. It's going to be just a great day of celebration. So yeah. we're really looking forward to it. So yeah, just uh, if you want to be a part of that, let us know. You know, yeah. it'd be really great. Yeah. Yeah, you can you can register on online again if you go to foothills.cc/events. If you have a little one that that you and your spouse or just you you want to you want to say to the Lord, I'm giving this child to you. I want to raise this little one to love and honor you. That would be a great day for you to do that, and that's on May 8th. And also, if you have kids and you have a, you have a spouse, we have a parents' night out, and that's on May 13th. Bring the kids. We have free child care. You get a couple hours to go out with your spouse or friends just to have a just to have some re- relaxation, some fun time while other people are taking care of your kids. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. All you gotta do, all you gotta do is register. That's let right. us know. Um, that way we know how much little have a little snack for them. Yep. Register. Let, let us know. Yeah. We have a, just a great time out yeah. in the community. It'd be great. It'd be great. Yeah. Rod and I actually took our wives out a little double yes. date last yeah. time. It was yeah. fantastic. I think we should do it again. I think we should. I think we should. Yeah. Right. It'd be it's, awesome. It's, it's just going to happen. But uh, yeah, you can register on that. If you go, go to foothills.cc slash events, you'll see the Parents Night Out logo there. Click it, register, and that'll be uh, a great night for you. But guys, thank you again for joining us. Enjoy the service. We pray that uh, that you feel God move in your life and, and God just does big, big, big things. Yeah, we'll see you soon. Thanks, guys.
morning, Foothills. You guys can go ahead and take a seat for just a moment. Thank you guys for joining us this morning. If this is your first time, we want to say welcome. Thank you for joining us. You um, probably received a connection card when you walked in. So we want you to fill that out. Let us know that this is your first time. Bring it to our guest room after the service. We would love to meet you. We will have some of our staff there and we have a free gift for you. And again, that's just a way to say thank you for joining us today. Um, but if you're not a first time guest, we still want you to fill that card out as well. If you have any prayer requests, if you have any questions about how you can get connected or how you can serve, you can fill that out and drop it in one of the buckets on your way out. But again, one of the ways, um, one of the things on that card is for you to let us know that you wanna get connected. And one thing that we have going on today is the launch of our small groups. So if you have not signed up for that yet, we have um, some groups for, we have discipleship groups, resource groups, we have community groups and some interest groups. So whether you enjoy paintball, you enjoy kayaking, if you just wanna do life with a group of people and go through the Bible study together, um, we have a group for you. So it is not too late. If you have not signed up, you can head over to foothills.cc slash groups. And again, that kicks off today. Um, so where are parents in the room today? Any? We have like two, maybe? Okay, cool. So um, we actually have our parent-child dedication coming up soon. So that is gonna be on May the 8th. That is on Mother's Day. Guys, that is your free reminder that Mother's Day is coming up if you have not gotten a gift yet. Um, but we have our parent-child dedication and that is where we as a church come alongside you guys to make a vow that we are gonna raise our children in God-centered homes and we are going to equip our children to go out and be disciples for Jesus. So again, that is on May the 8th. You can get signed up on our site for that as well. And then on May the 13th, we have our parents' night out. Who's excited for that? Yeah, couple, two more people, cool. So yes, this is gonna be a fun night where you can bring your kids here. We have free childcare. That deserves a little bit of an applause, right? Yeah, okay. All right, so we have free childcare. You can go out to dinner with your spouse. You can go out with friends. You can go back home, but you do have to come pick them back up. So um, we will have that on May 13th. Um, guys, but all of this is possible because of your generosity. We could not do any of this if you guys weren't as generous as you were. I wanna remind you of the three ways that you can give this morning. That's gonna be on the screen. You can give online at foothills.cc slash give. You can drop it in our offering box on the way out or you can give on the app. Um, so if you'll go ahead and stand back up with me, we are going to enter back into a time of worship this morning. Let us pray. Lord, thank you so much for these opportunities to serve and to give back to you, Lord, for everything that you give to us. Thank you for these opportunities to be connected with those around us, whether it's through groups or whether it's going to dinner with friends, Lord. Thank you for all of these opportunities to further your kingdom and to come alongside each other, Lord. Um, it doesn't matter what we're going through, Lord. We know that we need each other, but we need you first and foremost, Lord. So we just thank you for all that you do. We thank you for your steadfastness, for your faithfulness, Lord. We're thankful that you never leave, you never desert us, Lord. We um, just pray that you are with us through this worship set this morning. We pray that you speak through Kevin this morning, Lord, and that we hear your voice loud and clear. We pray all these things in your name, amen.
been strong and I've been broken within a moment. I've been faithful and I've been reckless at every bend. I've held everything together and watched the shadow. I've stood all and I have crumbled in the same.
of us right where we are. But God, you won't leave us there. God, you want to meet us. You want relationship with us, God. I'm so grateful. Even me, God. And every single person in this room. And God, I love that you meet every single person right where we are. Exactly how you know we need. God, I'm so grateful. God, I pray right now that you would open hearts and minds to hear what you have prepared for Kevin to share. And God, they're not ready. God, I pray that you would call for healing in people's lives today, that they would return to you and seek after you to truly know you. It's in your name I pray. Foothills, how we doing? Good, good. Fired up. Hey, can we say thanks to the worship team? That was awesome. It was awesome just now. We're just going to bring the lights down low. Let's get a little louder. Can we say thank you to the worship team again? <laughs> it's awesome. I'm not sure why we lost. There we go. There we go. Everybody doing good? Hey, um, if I've not met you, my name is Kevin. And I serve as one of the pastors here. I want to say a special welcome to you. And I want to say a special welcome. Today's the second Sunday that we are inviting our Foothills Espanol to join us in the house. Can we say thank you to them for joining us? I want to ask you, if you were to guess, what is the most highlighted verse in the Bible or the most searched verse in the Bible right now? We can actually trace this by looking at Amazon Kindle. They have, they have tracking for this, and obviously Google Analytics can tell us what people are searching. Uh, but if you were to guess, what, what verse might come to mind? For, for me, I, I went immediately to really popular verses. When it's like John 3.16, you know, God sold the world, He gives only son, so on and so forth. And, or I went to what athletes, you know, will, will portray a lot. They go to Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But I found this really interesting. This is the most popular verse right now, the most highlighted verse. This is Philippians 4, 6. And it says this, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. People are searching for, an for answers around their anxiety. And today we're going to have a discussion about anxiety and depression and mental health. This is a heavy topic. Um, earlier this week when I sent my notes over um, to, to the lady that does our translation for Foothills Espanol, she immediately texted and said, I have anxiety that we're talking about anxiety on Sunday. And, and some of you, I, I just want to like address, some of you, the alarm like just, just went up and and I, I, I just want to say, like, this is going to be a safe place and a safe conversation. It is a heavy topic, but it's worth us discussing. And I believe that God's going to show us some incredible things. But before we dive into it, I want to set some ground rules. Because there is, this is such a vast topic, um, I want to be clear on what we are talking about and what we're not talking about today. There is a side of this conversation that is a medical side. There is medicine involved. We're learning a ton about how to address this issue with, with, um, w within humanity. And I want to be clear that we're not going into that side. That side of the conversation is very real. It's very sensitive and, and it deserves space. But we don't have time to get into that today. So on the flip side of that, what I want to be clear about is that as we open God's word and we look at how he feels about this, I want to be clear that nothing that I am saying is intended to place God's word in opposition to medicine. 
This isn't to say, no, none of that counts or none of that matters. These are, these, are, these, these are two separate things. That's not how we're approaching this today. How we're approaching this is the Bible is full of people who dealt with mental health the way we see it even in our world today. And we want to see, like, what does God feel about this issue? Because people aren't just looking to God for answers. Even before the pandemic, when anxiety obviously spiked, Barnes & Nobles had just recently shared a statistic, this was in 2019, that year over year they saw a 25% increase in books related to mental health, tied to anxiety, depression, and, and suicidal thoughts. In the U.S., one in five adults have a mental health disorder. One in five, and just for context, that is 40 million people that struggle with mental health. That's just adults. It's carrying on and, and growing even in children today. We're seeing the effects of social media on, on our children and around mental health. It's one in four kids who deal with mental health. So whether you are in this room today and you carry this as a struggle or not, it's very likely that you know someone in your life who struggles with it, or there may be a season where you struggle with it, and that's why I believe it's important for us to look at God's word together. Because in the Bible, there were, there were distinct heroes of faith that God used for incredible things who also dealt with this. I want to just list a few names who dealt with suicidal thoughts, even in scriptures. Heroes and leaders like Moses, like King David, which if you've read the Psalms, you've probably seen some of the ups and downs that he went, he went through. There's Job. There's Judas, who was one of Jesus' disciples. There's Samson. There's King Saul. There's King Saul's armor bearer. And today I want to look at the prophet Elijah, and I want to look at his run-in with depression. If you've got your Bibles, would you turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19? If you've got the version app, you can just select the events tab and that'll give you today's notes. It says, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he being Elijah, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. And so he said, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. And he laid down under the bush and he fell asleep. Goes to a bush. He's absolutely broken. He's his worst moment. He's contemplating. He's just saying, Lord, just, just take me now. Like, take my life. I'm done. And then he goes to sleep. And I just want to address that some of you may be watching online. Some of you may be here right now. And you feel this way right now. Before we go any further, I just want to say that the Lord sees you. And I'm excited that you're here for this discussion today. And for the rest of us, if there's someone in your life who's dealing with this, my prayer as we have this conversation is that God would give you tools to show his love to them because God is pursuing us even in these moments. Before we dive into the Lord's response, I, I want us to address who Elijah is and figure out like how he got to this place. Why is he feeling this way? So Elijah was a prophet in Israel's history at a time where Israel was split into two nations. There was a northern kingdom that had seceded from Judah, and, and both of these nations were divided and at odds with each other, but ultimately they were headed in the same direction. What was happening was they were getting further and further from how God intended Israel to live within the promised land, and they were getting further and further from their incredible relationship with God. Both nations were headed in a bad direction that would eventually lead to exile where they would lose the very gift that God had given them in the promised land. But of the two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and Judah, the northern kingdom was in way worse shape. After the, the kingdom split, uh, the northern kingdom would have 19 straight kings who would reject the God of Israel. And the nation, as they knew it, it was experiencing corruption. Things were dark. Well, Elijah was a prophet in this northern kingdom where things were rough. And here's what the role of a prophet was at this time in Israel's history. They would have some fun things where they got to 
remind Israel of these incredible promises that God had for them. They would have time where they would get to shed light on the hope of the future, of the coming of a Messiah one day that would save Israel. And that was, that was hope-filled and exciting stuff. But they also had some difficult jobs. Sometimes what the prophets had to do is they had to give warnings to Israel of the consequences that were coming because Israel was continuing to reject the covenant relationship that God had with them. And because they were removing themselves from God, because their families weren't operating in the best way that God had designed it, the, the prophets were there to warn them and say, here is the results of where you are headed is, is not good. They brought bad, like bad signs of what's coming. And as a result, prophets weren't absolutely loved within the nation. They often were an annoyance or people wanted to reject them. And this is the time that Elijah's in where the nation is corrupt and rejecting God. Elijah is the one who is close to God. In fact, the northern kingdom, what they did is they had, they had their hopes set on two false gods, a false god named Baal and a false god named Asherah. And their hope in these gods were that these gods would provide them with everything they need. But that was false. Elijah had the hope in the one true God. And so there's a couple of misconceptions about anxiety and depression that Elijah's story kind of give me a little bit of empathy and I want to share that with you. But first, I want, to, I want to share with you that in 2018, I walked through my first season of anxiety. This was something that honestly was a far off idea, something I knew some other people had struggled with, but I hadn't personally experienced this. And if you've ever walked through this season, you know that it's kind of overwhelming because it's not it's not just a mental thing, it's also, it's also a physical thing that, that's going on. And so like while trying to address it and figure out what's going on, I did the worst thing you can do. I looked up symptoms on Google and I got every answer under the book for what was going on. But as I started to zero in and realize like this was anxiety, I tried to figure out like how, how can I fix this? And one of the first feelings I had may relate with you if you've ever dealt with mental health issues. I carried a lot of shame. I carried a lot of shame because I looked at people around me and their, their life and their circumstances and I thought, you know, um, they're in worse shape than I am maybe in life. So I'm a pastor, so I should just be well. So I carried shame because I felt like I, I couldn't talk to anyone about this as I felt odd. I couldn't, I couldn't even, I couldn't really explain it when I was walking through this season. And so what I did is then I, then I tried to fix it. I started to, to try to pray more and spend more time in, in scripture. And during that, I was quickly reminded that my relationship with God is not a transactional relationship. A relationship with God is not designed for me to experience the most comfort I can in my life. This isn't for me to go to him and say, God, things aren't as they should. Would you fix it and make me better and, and fix everything I need? Like, I, I just, I want to be comfortable again. I, and he waves his magic wand and everything's back. That's not how a relationship with God works. And I had to walk through this and, and, and learn this. We've, so there's, there's, all right, sorry, I got a little vulnerable. There's a couple of things that, are so helpful to know about the, the fact that Elijah is the one dealing with this that I wish I would have known in 2018. And if you're taking notes, these aren't gonna be lower thirds. You might write this down. There's a misconception. Number one, this is a misconception. I wanna just clarify, misconception. If you are close to God, you will not experience anxiety and depression. I wanna clarify, that is a misconception. That is not truth. I'm going to state it again. If you are close to God, you will not experience anxiety or depression. Remember, Israel, the northern kingdom, is corrupt. Elijah is the prophet who's hearing from God and speaking on his behalf. Elijah is the one who is close to God. In fact, he thought he was the only one close to God, which we'll see in a moment. Elijah was close to God, and yet he is the one dealing with this anxiety and depression. That is a misconception. The second misconception that's pointed out from this story is the misconception that if I do the right things, 
If I do what God asks me to do, then I'll never experience anxiety and depression. You may have heard this phrase we say a lot that if you obey, the Lord will bless you, that blessings follow obedience. And that is a very true statement, but I think sometimes the struggle I have, and maybe you have this same struggle, is we like to create the definition of what blessings mean. And so maybe one of those definitions that we like to create is that a blessing for me obeying is that I will never experience any type of mental health issue, any type of anxiety or depression. But this is not true because I wanna show you the way that Elijah was following God just before this. If you were to read 1 Kings 17 and 18, you would see Elijah walking in obedience and doing some epic things for God that would almost deserve a party. Remember, I I shared Northern Kingdom. They had two false gods they put hope in, Baal and Asherah, to provide them with what they needed. Well, God wanted to expose that, that they didn't need to have faith in those gods, that they're false and fake, and that he's the one who would provide. So what he did is he allowed a seven-year drought in the northern kingdom at this time. And Elijah is who he used, and Elijah chose to obey, to pray for God to bring rain once again and prove that there's only one God in Israel. Elijah saw this. This was absolutely incredible. And 1 Kings 18, this is a fun story to go read. Elijah has a showdown with 850 false prophets who represent Baal and Asherah. And Elijah's all by himself in this battle with the God of Israel, representing the God of Israel. And there's even some humor involved in this story where he mocks these false prophets. I, would, I seriously would encourage you to go check out and read this story. But essentially, he calls on fire from heaven to prove that there's only one true God that's the God of Israel. And God provides, and it's epic. It's absolutely epic. It's so epic that this northern kingdom that was corrupt and rejecting God had a revival. And they end up calling out and declaring that there's only one true God. The whole nation turned to God from this epic moment. And how I picture following epic moments where we do the right thing and we get the win, so to speak, is I picture going to the locker room, popping the champagne bottle, and turning on We Are the Champions because this is incredible. But that's not what followed this moment for Elijah. What followed this epic moment of him obeying and looking for the Lord's blessing, we see him run to a bush and want his life to end. It is a misconception to think that if you just do what you're supposed to do, that you won't experience anxiety and depression. Instead, Elijah's at this bush and He's broken, he's at his lowest, and he's wondering where God is. And what I want to talk about and look at today is just a few things in the the little bit of time we have left. A few things that we can learn about how much God cares about you in this moment and in these broken moments. That when Elijah was running from God and broken, God was pursuing Elijah, and he wanted to meet specific needs that he cared deeply about in Elijah's life. The first need, number one, God will meet our physical need. God will meet our physical need. Let's go back to the scriptures. Then he laid down under the bush. This is the bush he's crying out to God. He fell asleep, fell asleep, which by the way, how many of you know when you're walking through mental health, the, the right step is like to sleep. And I'm not just talking about physically. Sometimes we go to sleep emotionally. Sometimes we go to sleep mentally. Sometimes we go to sleep uh, relationally. We'll do whatever it takes to not feel the thing that we don't want to feel. And that's where Elijah's at. He's asleep. And all at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then laid down again. And the angel of the Lord came back a second time. And he touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey's too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank and strengthened by that food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and he spent the night. He pursued Elijah. He sent an angel of the Lord and he met his physical need. He knew that this wasn't just a mental problem that Elijah was dealing with. He knew that Elijah was exhausted physically and that he was hungry and he wanted to restore him, to prepare him for this journey where it would continue. But this characteristic of God, it's stated a couple of other places in scripture that I wanna point out. 
King David wrote this in, in one of the Psalms at a season when he was running as well. He said this, Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Elijah is brokenhearted and, and he's run off and the Lord draws near. He is close. He desires to draw near. And no matter where you run in your broken moments, you can't outrun God. And whatever your heart is broken over, the situation that you're rock, walk, walking through, it's not too big for God, but it's also not too small for him. It's not unimportant for him. He cares intimately about the areas of your heart that feel broken. As David said, he draws near to the brokenhearted and he wants to save those who are crushed in spirit. And I love that he does it in a practical way, that he knows what you practically need. It reminds me of what Jesus said. This is another place where this characteristic is pointed out. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. The Lord cares about your physical need and he will meet your physical need. When they get to the cave, we're gonna read in a moment, but what gets revealed is that Elijah doesn't just have a physical need. He's struggling relationally. He feels lonely. And if you've ever dealt with mental health before, loneliness is the company that follows you into those struggles. Lonely is absolutely present in these moments. And so that's the second need that God cares about and wants to meet here and meets for Elijah. Number two, God will meet our relational need. God will meet our relational need. So back to the scriptures. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. And I'm the only one left and now they're trying to kill me too. In other words, God, I've been obedient. I've done the right things. I'm close to you. Here's what's happened. It's not gone how I hoped. Now I'm wanted and I'm all alone and I'm just kind of fed up. I'm like, I'm done. I'm only one here. Well, I want to skip ahead to verse 18 and we'll come back to read what's in between. But this is how the Lord responded. He said, yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel. 7,000 people is what he's talking about. All whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. In other words, Elijah, you're not even close to alone. You're not even close to alone. There are 7,000 others who feel as you feel. There are 7,000 others who are prepared to be with you, to walk with you, that are with us as God is, is, is saying to him. One of the tactics of the enemy, we struggle with mental health issues, we take mental health out of it. We could we just say any issue real, real quick. But one of the tactics of the enemy is that he wants you to be isolated and feel completely alone. He wants you to buy into the idea that you're the only one. Remember how I said like in my season I was carrying shame Part of my shame was like, I mean, I, I don't know who to talk to because I feel odd that I'm, I'm going through this and maybe I shouldn't. And he loves when we're isolated. He loves when we are alone. And I don't care what the struggle is. I want to encourage you this morning that you're absolutely not alone. Remember what we said earlier? One in five U.S. adults deal with mental health disorders. That's just the people talking about it. That's over 40 million people. And you could remove it and add any struggle. I promise you, you're not the only one walking through what you think that you're walking through alone. And there is power in talking about it. There's power when Elijah admits that that's what he's feeling because he allows God to shed light and show him that he is not alone. And sometimes God will use an angel to draw near and be with us in our lonely moments. But another way he does it is he's preparing 7,000 people. He's got people. He uses people. And that's why we exist as a church is because he uses people to make sure that you know you're not walking through anything in your life alone. And one of the functions of the church, Paul said this in Galatians. He said, carry each other's burdens 
And in this way, you'll fulfill the law of Christ. It's one of the gifts of this community. And I wanna just encourage you this morning, if you are walking through issues around mental health right now, don't walk it alone. Talk to someone. Talk to a spouse, talk to your friend, talk to a family member, talk to a counselor. Don't walk it alone. In fact, utilize what God's given right here in this church. If, if your engagement here at Foothills is to show up on Sunday and experience an hour service, you'll hear the word and we've got an incredible worship team. It'll be a good experience but you, you're literally getting the bare minimum of what God intended for this community to offer you. There are incredible ways for you to connect with other people. And we're gonna talk about it actually right after this service. We're having our next lunch, which is designed to help you learn more about the church. It's designed to help you get plugged in. And our desire is to plug you into a place to serve where you can find your purpose, but ultimately to be with a tribe of people so that you're not walking alone. God wants to meet the relational needs in your life. And we're gonna talk about all the groups that we have launching today, opportunities for you to dig into God's word in a community that's gonna support you, that's gonna love you, where you can talk about the things that you're walking through. And so whether you're new with us at Foothills or if you've been here for a few years, if you are on the outside looking in, if this is all you're experiencing, stick around. You got lunch, childcare, it's gonna be awesome. But most importantly, it's gonna be awesome for you. In order for other people to carry, carry your burdens, you have to allow that. <laughs> so this would be a step where you can allow God to offer you the bread and offer you the relationships, the 7,000 that he's got set aside for you. The third need that God cares deeply about and he wants to meet in your life God will meet our soul need. God will meet our soul need. Remember when Elijah gets to the cave, God strikes up a conversation. He asks him why he's there. Elijah's like, I did what you said, and now I'm wanted and I'm alone. This isn't great. Okay. So God says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to come out of the cave. I want you to go to the side of the mountain. I'm going to pass by. It's a really cool story in scripture where there ends up being some noise that comes by. There's, there's a great wind and then a great earthquake and then a, a, a great fire. And in each of those, the Lord wasn't present. So Elijah's looking for God and he sees all the noise, but God's not there. And finally, it's a gentle whisper that arrives and that's where the Lord is. But when they strike up the conversation again, it's so interesting because it's pretty much just deja vu. It's the exact same conversation that they just had in the cave. The Lord asks Elijah the same exact question. Let's look. Voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. He goes through the whole, the whole thing. If you read it, it's word for word. I've done what you've asked. Okay, here I am. Now I'm wanted and I'm all alone. I find it so interesting that the Lord uses this crazy example to come to him, but all to have the exact same conversation and I really believe that it's because the Lord wanted to sit in these feelings and in this moment with Elijah a bit longer. He didn't restore him at the bush and just like send him back to Israel. He allowed him to continue on this journey. And now he's having a conversation where he's asking him, Elijah, why are you here? And he's asking him it twice. And he's having Elijah kind of process and, and talk about this. And why? Well, honestly... This is what Elijah is already doing. When we're at our lowest in, in mental health areas, that's the big question that we're asking. And that question comes from deep in our soul. We're asking the question like, why am I still here? Because the struggle, the, the lie the enemy wants you to believe and especially Elijah, who feels alone in a nation who's rejected the God that he serves, feels alone. The lie is like, I'm not going to be missed if I'm gone. My purpose is gone. That's the attack on the soul that the enemy wants to do. He wants to attack the soul by showing you, you don't have purpose. This is what Elijah's wrestling with. Like, why am I still here? And rather than God just ignore that issue, God wants to talk about it. He wants to address it. 
This isn't a question to avoid. He's not afraid of this conversation. He says, I want to be engaged in this conversation. And so he asks him a couple of times, Elijah, why are you still here? And he's allowing Elijah to verbalize. And then he begins speaking to the need in Elijah's soul. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. And when you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshai, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat. From Abel, Mahola, to succeed you as prophet. And he tells him a couple things that are gonna take place. But essentially, he gives him a new assignment, a new purpose. And one of those is to anoint his successor in Elisha. And this was, this was really important because if you continue reading through scripture, you see that Elisha needed a mentor. He needs someone to show him the ropes. And Elijah ends up accepting this responsibility and this role. He pours into Elisha. And this makes a massive difference because if you read 2 Kings, Elisha would go on to do twice as many miracles as Elijah did. He would represent God in an incredible way, and that took place because Elijah allowed God to meet his soul's need to renew purpose. When we're struggling and we're asking the questions, why am I here? God wants to get involved, and he wants to give us a renewed purpose, a renewed vision for the areas of our life that we feel like we've lost vision for or can't see. He wants to restore those areas of our soul that feel lost broken with renewed purpose. When Elijah's saying, I'm no longer relevant, I'm no longer capable, God is saying, I'm not done with you yet. When I was walking through the worst part of my season of anxiety, I was trying every tactic I could Every, I was gathering any piece of advice that I could remember and just, just trying what I could. So one of, one of them was, I had someone, heard someone say one time, when you're struggling with this, play out every worst case scenario possible and you'll see that it's, it's not, even the worst case scenario is not as bad as it. So I did that and it, that was great and it helped me and yes, I've got Jesus and eternity and all of that, that's great. I'm, I'm not downplaying that, but what I am saying is, the next day, the anxiety was still there. That didn't just magically cause the anxiety to disappear. And then I, I tried praying it away. Believe me, I prayed a lot. I tried praying it away. And the next day, the anxiety continued to show up, which really, really caused me to continue to struggle. But what I did choose to do is I chose to continue showing up and to continue giving effort into prayer and scripture. And over the course of time, I started to recognize something that was happening and changing within me. Up to this point in my life, this is 2018, I grew up in church, okay? I've been in ministry um, since, since right out of high school, okay? I've been following the Lord for a long time and I've been pretty disciplined about my quiet time with him. But what I started to recognize is something changed in this season where I was struggling. There was a big change that started to occur in how I went about my time with him. It was no longer a checklist. I was desperate. And I was beginning to depend on him. I was searching anywhere I could in my relationship with him for answers. And as I went about my time with him, that way things started to change. I was attacking it with a focus and with effort. Look, I know me. When I'm passionate about someone or something, I know the level of effort that's going to be put into that. When I look at my life before this situation in, in 2018, this season in 2018, I was not going about my time with God with the same level of effort that would communicate if you knew me deep down in my heart that would say that I value him above other things. But in this season, that started to flip upside down. And as a result, I got to start to experience the intimacy that God had been longing to have with me. I got to experience the fact that there were broken areas in my heart that no one or nothing could ever address except the one who created me. 
I got to experience how he wanted to walk with me in these difficult seasons. And I got to see that like prayer and scripture, they didn't just eradicate the anxiety, but the anxiety that I was experiencing influenced my dependency on prayer and scripture, which influenced my relationship with my creator. So much so, so much so, that was, that was a difficult season. My relationship with God has been so impacted and added so much richness to my heart that I would be crazy enough, if I could go backwards, I would pray for the anxiety to come on all over again so that I could get exactly where I, I, I could, with, like where I am with God today. And if I knew that there was still major gaps, which I'm sure there is, I'm sure there's more that I can gain from my relationship with God. I'm sure there's still more that he wants to reveal about how he, who he is and how he sees me, areas in my heart he wants to speak to. If anxiety is the path, I'll take it because he's worth it. I want to show you um, how I wake up in the mornings. Make sure I got the volume turned up. I apologize in advance. Yeah. Just keep it going? No, okay. Uh, that's the worst noise in the world. Um, some of you might use a uh, elevator jingle to wake up and you wake up really happy and your makeup's already on or whatever, I don't know. That's great. That's fantastic, all right. Uh, the rest of us need to be punched in the face to wake up, and that's how I am. I'm going to be like, oh, okay, all right, all right, here we go. That's a good, that's a good way. I've got to start the day. This alarm I use, it is an important part of my day because if I don't start my day right, there's typically a domino effect. If I didn't wake up on time today, it, it might have been weird if I didn't show up to preach at first service because I was still sleeping, right? That would be a little bit odd. There, was a, there would be a domino effect. This is an important part of my day. It captures my attention wakes me up and gets me going. I started thinking about Elijah. He was close to God and he experienced a move of God like crazy. And yet what followed was anxiety and depression and he ran off. And I really believe that part of that is because God wanted to make sure that Elijah didn't learn to just depend on himself. That it was God who had really moved in his life and in Israel, and it was God who was going to move in the future. And he might have allowed this anxiety and depression to continue reminding Elijah that he still needed God. What if anxiety and depression is not eradicated because God wants to continue showing you and showing this world that there is no answer outside of Jesus and that we absolutely need to depend on him? Like what if it is his gift to allow it to still be present? It says in Philippians 4, 6, don't be anxious about anything. Like don't, don't continue walking in anxiety, but feelings of anxiety, they could be alarm signals. My wife showed me this. It is, it, this was written by a Christian counselor. It says anxiety is an indicator within our emotional beings, a flashing light on our journeys that can tell us several, several things. Like what if, what if this is the flashing symbol of God saying, look, I'm here. I want a relationship with you. Anxiety that you feel is not sin. Depression that you feel, not all depression is sin. But it is a result of sin. Things are not how they should be in our world. They're not how they should be in your heart. They're not how they should be in your family because of sin. And the gift of that knowledge and your eyes being open to that is that God wants to show you that he has a plan to restore that. He has a plan to meet your physical need. He has a plan to meet your relational need. And he has a plan to restore and meet your soul's need. And the greatest need that you have in your soul and that I have in my soul is that we need a savior for our sins. Our sin has separated us from our creator, a holy, perfect, and righteous creator. But God didn't leave us in this state of separation. He's been pursuing us since the beginning of time. And he sent his son Jesus, who knew no sin, to take your sin and my sin 
as a punishment on the cross. And when God raised him from the dead, it was made clear that anyone who would call on the name of Jesus would be saved. I said at the beginning of this, we're not gonna have a medical side discussion. That's true, but I, I would be unfair and unkind to not be very clear with you before you leave today. There is a lot you can learn in medicine when it comes to, medic, or to, when it comes to uh, mental health. But what medicine will never give you and never do for you, it cannot save you from your sins. There's no doctor, there's no game plan, there's one way, and that's by calling on the name of Jesus. And some of you have been putting that off, and some of you need to do that right now, today, and I wanna give you that opportunity. You could ask him to save you from your sins, and he can begin restoring your soul right now. You might just pray a prayer like this as we pray. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need you. And you might just tell him in your own words what, what you feel is broken. My soul feels broken. My heart is broken. My marriage feels broken. My job, my career, my purpose. He is your creator and he draws near to the broken heart. Wherever you're broken, you could just be honest about it. Now you might confess, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know my sins have separated me from you. But I believe that you died for me. And I believe that God raised you from the dead. So today I ask you to save me. And begin healing my broken heart. And I'm going to commit to follow you from this day forward. God, I pray for the rest of us in here today. Lord, I pray that when we have moments of anxiety and depression, I pray that we would hear that alarm and that we'd run to you. God, that we would continue to depend on you and need you. I pray that today would spark effort in our relationship with you. Lord, I pray that today would spark effort in our relationship with one another. Lord, I pray there are people in this room considering whether or not they should stick around uh, for, for next. God, if you're stirring, I pray there would just be a response to step in and allow you, God, to help meet the relational need that we all have. Lord, I pray there would be those that would take that step today. And Lord, where we're physically broken, we just say we trust you. Would you provide? Jesus, we love you so much. We thank you for what you've done on the cross. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Wow, what a great word from Pastor Kevin That's Blaine. Great. It was great. awesome. Yeah. Just, I love his passion yep. and his love for the church. Yep. If you have given your life to Jesus, uh, please let us know. We want to help walk with you in that journey, help support you any way we can. Yeah. If you got our prayer requests, let us know, submit it, and we'll be there for you. Right, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and if, if God saved you this morning, you, could, you can be baptized the very next Sunday. And Yeah, so please let us yes. know. And also, I, I do want to say, since Kevin talked about anxiety and depression, guys, if you are struggling with those things, and you feel like you, you want to talk to a pastor, let your moderator know and we can we would love to reach out to you and help you in that as well. Um, but guys, like we mentioned before, Foothills is a great place to get connected. We have lots of ways for you to do that. Go to foothills.cc slash connect. Fill out that card. Let us know how we can be walking through life with you and getting you more involved in all that God is doing here at Foothills. Yeah. Have a great Sunday. We love you. See you soon. Thanks, guys.